حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون الذين إذا ذكر الله وجلت قلوبهم وإذا تليت عليهم آيات زادتهم إيمانا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد <coughs> All praise belongs to Allah and I begin in his blessed name while we're in this blessed month of Ramadan and of course in heightened alertness towards his grace and recognizing his mercy and we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases our faith and makes us more humble, more focused and of course clear in our vision as to why and what our purpose is on this, on this earth and that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> to protect us from our own evilness from our evil inclinations due to our ignorance which is also due to our arrogance and in this blessed month of Ramadan it's important that we spend time reflecting and uh, mashallah I see during these lectures I have a lot of brothers and sisters who come and talk to me you know explaining what they understood in the presentation what their uh, belief systems are where the confusions are how do they counter the questions people have with regards to authenticity of religion in terms of the authenticity of the Quran <clears throat> and whether or not even God exists or doesn't exist and it varies in different scales and I find that to be very beautiful because that kind of dialogue in conversation in sharing is what Allah loves most the Holy Prophet was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> that when my believers are busy acquiring knowledge to know their purpose in life and to recognize me, even if death was decreed for them at that moment, Allah postpones it. Now you might ask, well, Allah already knew that would happen. That is true. Allah knows what will happen, but Allah also engages us in our own destiny. Allah says, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma biqawmin Indeed, Allah does not change the affairs of a community until the community changes themselves first. Or at least not first, but community changes themselves in the sense of proactiveness, meaning we have to get involved. So we can pray to Allah to change our destiny. We can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our lives better. But if we do not take the step forward, towards that direction, then this prayer is nullified. And, and dua, and I'll talk about the power of dua, you know, in these nights, how important it is to pray and to seek. And why do we have dua? And why does dua exist? You know, what is the function of prayer? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, why does he want us to pray to him? Is he in need of prayer? What is the function behind prayer? All these are very essential pieces of the equation that helps us to become better human beings. Yesterday I touched on some uh, critical social problems we're having in society today. I'd like to continue briefly on that before I move on. <clears throat> As I mentioned yesterday, we have to find our balance in life. Television, internet, cell phones, you know, uh, technologies, laptops, computers, none of these are bad. But they can become very bad if we abuse them excessively. It's like food. Food is good for us, it's essential, but it can be debilitating and dangerous. It can kill us. Even water, water which is what we are composed of, which is what makes us as living beings. And the earth is predominantly water also, you find that excessive drinking of water can kill you because there's a balance. You find Allah has created the world and the universe in a balance. And our objective is to find that balance. You know, when you talk about haq, Imam Ali salam describes it beautifully in Najul Balagha. He says, what is haq? What is justice? 
An Imam replies that justice is giving everything its proper due. Meaning, giving what it deserves. Not too much, not too little. He says, were you to unfold the seat of justice for me, I will not deny an insect the grain that it deserves. Because Imam is saying, I'm a man of justice. I bring balance. I show you what to do and what not to do. Whereas this total condemnation of something is dangerous and total immersion in something could be dangerous, you will find that there's a balance. Even salah, even praying, you will notice that excessive praying, and I'm, and I'm going to define salah here, there are two kinds of salah. One is where your entire jism, your entire body, everything does for, for the sake of Allah. وَلِنَّ صَلَاتِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That form of ibadah is encouraged at all times, 24 by 7. There is no extremity to that. But in that action, you'll find there's a balance. But if you and I come to the masjid or at home and we're constantly praying, constant, where we say, today I'm going to do a thousand rakah. You know, I mean, we do just 17 rakah, for example, 17, which is one day's amount of prayer, it takes a while, you know. And if you do a hundred rakah, which we do typically sometimes in the nights of Qadr, you find it's tiring when you do a hundred, your knees start to hurt. But to do a thousand, it means you have no time for anything else. Now, it appears good, because this individual is in the worship of God. But Allah has created a balance for us that we have social obligations, family obligations. We have obligations to go and earn a living. We have obligations where we have to meet and greet society. All of those are also an essential part of ibadah. So when someone says, well, I'm not going to meet people, I'm going to lock myself in a room. If it's for a short period of time, it's a balance. But if it's a continual behavior, then it's an imbalance. There's a hadith of a man who was always praying in the masjid, constantly praying, and the Prophet would come and leave, and he would come and leave and see this man is praying all the time. So the messenger goes to him and says, MashaAllah, you pray a lot? He said, yes, I love to pray. He said, who takes care of your family? He said, my brother. He said, go home, your brother is better in the eyes of Allah than you. Because you are praying, you have abandoned your obligation towards your family. So you have created an imbalance in your obligations. So this balancing act is why we need to gain knowledge. Because there's the 80-20 rule I always follow. 80% knowledge, 20% effort. 20% knowledge, 80% effort. The first one is superior to the second. Because with 80% knowledge, you are... Your effort is less, which means you have more time to relax. You have more time to think. You have more time to do other things. So acquisition of knowledge. Utlub al-ilm min al-mahd ila al-lahd. Rasulullah said, acquire knowledge from the cradle to the grave. For when you increase your knowledge, your effort decreases. And when your effort decreases, you're able to do more. Now that doesn't mean that because the effort decreases that we're going to get lazy and we're not going to be healthy. No, because the more knowledge we have, the more opportunities we have. And the more the world becomes a canvas for us to achieve greater achievements, which means that that 20% effort now has a great room for us to do a lot more. So we should get together and gather in these scenarios. And the function behind these two should be to say, how can I gain knowledge so that I can live my, live my life in a balanced way. And sometimes one hour of reflection, as the Prophet has said, one hour of reflection is better than a thousand rak'ah of these extra rogatory prayers. You know, Salatul Layl. The thousand rak'ah that we pray sometimes, the Prophet says one hour of reflection is better than going up and down in Salah when there's no thought. In Kitab al-Aqal wal-Jahil, as you know, Imam Jafar Sadiq salam states that a man comes to him and says, my neighbor prays a lot. And the imam's first question was, how much does he know and understand what he's praying? He says, well, he prays a lot, but his understanding is minimal. The imam says, unfortunately, his reward is minimal. Though he prays a lot, you would think that the action is a lot. Yeah, but if there is lack of understanding in it, 
then the value is less. It's like when we know each other and we praise each other, but if we don't know each other well, then the praise has less meaning. But when someone knows you well and they praise you, it's got greater meaning because the depth of knowledge has a direct indication to the values that we lay upon ourselves. So in the month of Ramadan, while we recite Quran and we have these gatherings and we abstain from eating temporarily and therefore we have more time within ourselves to be reflective, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instituted كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting has been prescribed on you like it was before so that you become more God conscious. So I encourage us all as a society, brothers and sisters, let's refrain from gossiping. Let's raise our children to have low tolerance for gossip. Let's teach our children to have low tolerance for backbiting. Let's teach our children to have low tolerance for nonsense talk. Let's teach our children to indulge in reflective thinking and let them question even the most extreme questions. Let's not silence them. Let's have a behavior of constantly indulging in politics and social issues and psychology and philosophy and all the other matters of life that pertains to how we should grow and raise ourselves. This is the sunnah of the prophets and Ahlul Bayt. So in this month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us to do this. And sadly, sadly, I must say, as a human society, we recycle religion. Ramadan comes, we feel burdened, like, oh, God is going to stop me from eating and having my pleasures in life. And then we cannot wait to find that moon on the last day of Ramadan. We're so happy to celebrate it. Now, those are not bad, but holistically, you find Imam Zainul Abideen in his dua of, you know, dua al wida which is the dua he recites, he, which he wrote for us to recite. And we're telling, you know, he's basically thanking Allah for the Ramadan, but he's very sad that the month is leaving. He's very sad that this heightened alertness will reduce. So Allah is merciful. Were he to make us fast for more than a month, we would be burdened. And Allah does not put taklif on us. Allah wants to make religion easy. It was, he did not put religion to make it difficult, but he gives us just the right amount of dose. And scientists have shown that when a society indulges in the period that we fast, the 30 days, it has maximum benefit for society. One day of fasting, two days of fasting has benefit, but a protracted 20, 30 days of fasting is superior. And if you look at the principles of Islam, it, they are built on social grounds. Yesterday I spoke about the deleterious effect of extreme amounts of um, texting in the social arena for kids. They, have, they are showing statistics that since 2012, even up to 2012, homicide, for 24 years, homicide was higher than suicide. More people got killed than suicide. In the last 24 years, it's reversed. Homicide has gone down and suicide has gone up. And there's a reason for that. One of the reasons scientists have observed is that the children, they are so addicted to this instrument, go out much less. So they kill each other much less. They get into a death much less. So they are safer in their homes. Research shows. Now that may appear to be good, but actually because they're antisocial, they do not interact very well. So socially, they're inept, meaning they don't grow properly. They don't know how to communicate personally. They lack personal abilities. They're too engrossed in this. But suicide has gone up because the level of depression has doubled, tripled, quadrupled. So research has shown, and they've done direct studies, even using Facebook, that when children, and adults even, indulge in so many hours of Facebook, you find that their levels of depression and sadness increases quantitatively. Now you might think they're indulging, they're talking, they're socializing. Yes, but that level of socialization has a negative return post so many hours. As I mentioned yesterday, two hours is the cutoff limit. Anything less than two hours is acceptable within the balance. Anything more than that 
can be very dangerous for the children. They become depressed. Now, what happens as a result of depression? Many things end up. They start cutting themselves. They become suicidal. They actually start to plan suicide. Suicide planning is one of the precursors of suicide. They start to indulge in antidepressants. And of course, today with the opioid crisis, you're finding that the availability and accessibility of such items is so prevalent that you can go online and order them. You don't even have to leave your home. This is what's making Amazon so successful. The fact that everybody's lying in their homes, they don't even want to go shopping. So the mom and pop shops and the, even the shops are shutting down because everybody's ordering things online. So there's no interaction. There's no getting out of the house. Now when we examine this, okay, we have to be very careful and see what has Islam prescribed for us within this balance to understand that are we within the jurisdiction of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given the fact that we have such technologies, are we violating them and wait, what is the line? You find salah, jum'ah. Allah says, وَإِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَسَعْوِ لَا ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ When the time for Jum'ah prayers becomes obligatory, hasten to prayer. فَسَعْوِ لَا ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُوا الْبَيَّةِ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ How many of our Muslims today generally go for Jum'ah? Not as much as they should. We're all busy. We have excuses. We have no time. You know, we are engrossed in our pursuits of the surviving and money-making machineries. When in fact that exercise is extremely socially healthy. It's actually a counterpoint to these depressions. For many reasons. If you examine very successful nations, you will find that their media system and technology and information base is very powerful. They manage and they control societies. Noam Chomsky talks about this, manufacturing consent, where media controls the minds of the societies. And we've become drones, and we've become impulsive, where when a movie comes out, everybody wants to act like that. India is like that. Bollywood industry is like that. They can hardly afford food, but they wait in line to go watch a Bollywood movie. And then when the song comes out, they live in the song. And they become part of that fashion, and all the shops start selling that fashion now. It's an industry. It's a multi-billion, if not a trillion dollar industry. We have the same problem here. This impulsive, compulsive nature is predicated on the basis that we are not connected individually with thinking, with conversation, with deciding our own destiny. We have a higher order of instrumentation that's controlling our minds today, and we are basically like drones. Like if you watch the movie The Matrix, you will see that everybody is basically coming out of a pod and we're just following the rituals of what the masters have decided. We're living the matrix. Whereas the Quran has in, encouraged us to be reflective. And if you look at the principles of Jum'ah prayers, when we come, there are four rak'ah in Dhuhr. You see? It's wajib al takhiri meaning you can choose one of the two. Either you do Dhuhr Salah or you do Jum'ah. Sadly, we have this conversation today, how important is Jum'ah? When the Quran has stressed on it, we're discussing how important it is. There's something wrong with how we're approaching this. Allah's mercy is that he's taken two of the cycles out and made it as part of the khutbah, meaning that when you are speaking the two sermons, they become equivalent to the additional two rakah. So you have two sermons. One is on social matters, political matters, the events of the day. And the other is a spiritual matter on how I can become a better person. Look at Islam, solution, on an amplified social system where Allah has enjoined humanity to come forward shoulder to shoulder, to sit and to listen and to be given the latest and the greatest. And you find that the Western systems are most afraid of Jummah. Their Islamophobia system today, and it's trying to promote this hatred for Islam, you'll find if there is one system they're afraid of, it is Jummah. The power of Jummah is a media institution more powerful than all media put together. That's how powerful Jummah is. 
Hajj is another powerful social system that enemies of God are terrified when people come to Hajj because it brings you a portion of the human race together as a sampling of how we should be as one. You find that Islam has put that solution. Fasting. Allah could have told us, fast whenever you can. Pray whenever you can. Whereas Allah says, Aqim as salah. Aqim as salah. Aqim as salah till the look is shams. Ila ghasaq al layl. Maintain prayer. Right? Wa iqam as salati. Wa ita is zakati. Why is Allah commanding that? And Allah says, We have given it time, time for prayers. And when you get together, the Messenger said, if you do jama'ah, you need two people only. Jama'ah. Juma'ah, you need five. In jama'ah, you need two. And the Prophet said, the barakah multiplies. That when there are three, you start, cannot, at, 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 by the time you reach five, the Prophet says, you, can't, you cannot count the barakah. The mercy of jama'ah with five people is much greater than an individual praying on their own. Now, why is Islam promoting that? Why is jama'ah superior to farada? Why is it superior? Precisely to create interaction, social interaction. Precisely to make us social. Precisely to make us adept to sit together, to eat together, and to plan that after Jummah, let's go out for lunch. Or this community right here, when we have this lecture, after this lecture we have jama'ah, after the jama'ah we have iftar together. There are some communities that have no iftar. In the community I come from in Michigan, most of the centers have no iftar. No iftar. Because we have assimilated into a lifestyle where we feel that there should be no iftar, you know, on a grander social scale. People say, well, we're with the family. Okay, but there should be both family and outside. Why are the restaurants so full? Communities, Islamic centers should encourage iftar. And it should never be built on financial reasons. It's a shame on us as a community that if we cannot get together and contribute to have iftar together and to have the barakah of eating together the way it is the sunnah of Rasulullah, then what are we encouraging our children to become sedentary, to go into their homes and remain alone, aloof in their homes on their technologies because what good is a social environment? We can't even afford that. We should encourage it. We should try our best to be communal within our communities and have as many gatherings and sessions together, but have dialogue with it. Open up the channels and invite even people of other faiths to come and sit with us. This is the deen of Allah. We don't do that. So we are encouraging our children in the reverse. But when we have iftar here and everybody sits together and we meet each other and we shake hands and we talk, it's priceless. That is the medicine for all these diseases we're talking about. Depression, drug abuse, right? Uh, low sense of self-worth. Self All of these characters fade away when we become social. But of course, when we are social, we must practice good akhlaq. We should be kind with each other. Our tongue should not be harsh. Sometimes people stop coming to our Islamic centers. They stop coming to places of worship because some of us have a harsh tongue against them. And we make incendiary comments. We belittle them or we look down upon them, maybe they cannot afford nice clothes, and we make terrible comments, or they come from other cultures, or they are of a different race, and we look upon them as reverts and converts, or oh, that's a Christian, or oh, that's an atheist. This behavior is haram in Islam, haram. I am not holding anything back, I'm saying it beyond any doubt. For us to be, have bigotry within our hearts, and to be very, um, uh, insular, in other words, to say people from outside my community don't belong here. This act is detestable. This is exactly why Shaitan was removed from his status. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. These communities, this center, a beautiful center, you've got thousands and tens of thousands of people in this community surrounding us and of different cultures and of different backgrounds unfortunately sometimes we have insisted on our old cultural ways and forgotten the principles of islam 
And we have now lost generations who don't come to such centers because they feel marginalized and they're not important anymore and they end up going to clubs and they end up going to laundromats and malls simply to find their social grounds. Allah will hold us judge, uh, liable on judgment day. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِينَ MashaAllah, in this community, uh, our researcher Sheikh Bahraini is calling people of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons who come here. And you've got their leaders who come in here and who participate. And they're writing articles on our community about how good Islam is and how much we must eradicate our hatred for Islam. Isn't that what the deen is about? Allah says, قُلْ لِأَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَنْ لَا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا الله. You and I all live among such people. We socialize with them. We have friends with them. Why is it we become so myopic that when it comes time to remember Allah, we sanitize and we say, no, nobody else. It's exclusively for us. We are no different than those who claim to be chosen people of God, like the Bani Israel, who the Yahud Quran calls them. Ya yuladina hadu in za'amtum annakum lillahi min dunin nas. We are no different then. And I say this with my heart, my brothers and sisters. We have an obligation today particularly in today's time when Islam is the number one agenda in the political fronts. Muslims are being butchered as we speak and there's this silence while Gaza, 50 people were butchered. 18 out of 19 paramedics were shot directly with live ammunition. 18 out of 19 paramedics, unheard of. When the Red Cross goes out or the Red Crescent goes out or any paramedic group that goes out to help people on, on battlefields, it's international protocol to not touch them. And they're being shot with live ammunition. And 18 of them, and some were injured directly. Nobody's mentioning any words. And here we are bickering about, you know, our own little petty little issues on dumb little issues when we as Muslims are being taken like a soccer ball and kicked around like nothing. Alhamdulillah, the resistance is there. Alhamdulillah, some of them who have understood the message of Ahlul Bayt are the strongest, indomitable forces forming as we speak. Alhamdulillah. And we pray for that balance, for this hegemony of the superpowers that want to rule and, and dictate which nation should live, which na nation should die, who should be a leader, who should not be a leader. And they cannot even choose their own leaders. They've got clowns sitting in the White House and they think they are so smart. I'm an American citizen. I've got no compunction in saying that. That we have a president today who is the chief executive bully, who uses foul language, who's known to be a misogynist, if not a philanderer who's chasing women and paying off prostitutes and everybody shrugging their shoulders in this leadership. And we're going to decide on how the world should live. I do not want my children to take their moral grounds on such bases. I do not want my children to learn that such principles where we dictate and go and instigate and poke our fingers into the eyes of innocent people while they are being eradicated and their nations are being wiped out like the Rohingya Muslims or Yemen, which is going through a massive, massive destruction right now in this fluffed up society. We are all comfortable thinking what a lovely society when we are imploding from within ourselves. Now, are Americans bad people? No, they are one of the finest people in the world. One of the most charitable people in the world I have met. I grew up in this country. Some of the finest people I've ever met. People ask me, you speak about Islam. Who taught you? I said, my American society taught me Islam. They questioned, they guided, they cradled us. But it's not about that. We're talking about this problem globally. It's not only in America. In all Muslim countries, we have the same sickness. In Muslim countries, we have a lot of injustice. In Muslim countries, a lot of our youth are sad and depressed. It's no different. I've traveled the world. I see it in Asia, in America, in Africa, everywhere. I see it. It's pervasive. And I hope we take account that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the best religion. I don't need to go too deep into this. But the gift Allah has given us, if you and I take it, if this generation says, I am going to take it, it doesn't take too many people to change a society. Leaders need not be too many, but they, can be, they need to be profound. And we need to take the essence and the power of the deen Allah has given us and to utilize it properly in order for us to understand that we have a moral obligation and we are not bigots. We don't look down on Christians or Jews or atheists. No, we honor them all. We respect them. 
You might say, oh, do we tolerate them? I said, no, don't even use the word tolerate. Say the word, we respect them. There is no compulsion in religion. Truth is clear from error. My respected brothers and sisters, I say to you sincerely, I know these lectures are being heard globally, and I hope societies out there and young generations out there hear these calls and to say, yes, we must all rise together and take the gift of God, the way Allah has brought us to Hajj together, and say we are a united ummah, ummatan wahida, one united body. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً فَأَصْلِهُ بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ The believers are brethren. Make peace between them. Unite. You think the, the nations that are superpowers today want us to unite? I gave this example, South Korea and North Korea. They are eager to have peace between each other. They are fed up with that border. But the power says, no, you can't have it. We're going to keep instigating you. And the warmongers and the hawks in in Pentagon and Washington are waiting to start war because they've got all this piled up, stacked up machinery that they need to get rid of. And the world becomes victim. Children get, become orphans. Limbs get blown away. Do you think they care? They don't care at all. They just keep charging forward like the, the way Hitler did. He didn't care about how many Germans and how many Europeans and how many blacks and whites and Jews were killed. He didn't care about any of that. But you, Allah says, I will not change your affairs until you rise. That in this month of Ramadan, look at the sicknesses that our children are going through. Look at the sicknesses that we have. And the solution is very simple. Have social interaction. Have a sincere desire to meet. There's a rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built within us. There's a blessing between us. Allah created us because of his mercy. A brother come and ask me right now. It's in Surah Hud, verse 119. Allah says, I'll read it in English. If your Lord had pleased, he would have suddenly made a people a single nation. But they shall continue to differ. Because difference of opinion is here to stay. It's a lovely thing. When we have difference of opinion, it's a barakah. It's a rahmah. God says, ma khalqukum wa la illa ka nafsin wahida. We made you from one nation, but we are different. Everyone, even identical twins who are genetically identical, are different, different characters. They have similarities, but they're different. Every child born of its mother and father, they're different from the parents. There's some overlaps, but they're different. That difference is healthy. Some of us cannot handle difference. We want to eradicate difference. Oh, he is a Christian? Bad. Oh, he's a Sunni? Bad. Oh, he's a Shia? Bad. No, no. Difference of opinion is healthy. Leave it. Talk about it. Agree to disagree agreeably. And leave it. It's the de design of God. Allah loves difference of opinion. On judgment day, Allah will not question us whether or not we, we eradicated differences. Allah will question whether we came on the same terms to promote peace. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You are the best in the community. You promote good, you forbid evil, and you believe in God, but not at the cost of eradication of differences. No. Today, even within our own schools of thought, you follow marja A and you follow marja B. We have people who fight with each other because you follow one marja, and I don't like that marja. When did Allah allow us to pass such judgments? When? When people choose what they want, or they want to declare Eid on that day, sure, we should come to a common term and declare Eid as a united body so we can pray together. But if people desist or insist, then leave them alone. Be happy that they have a difference of opinion. Our maraja different, differ on fiqhi matters. It's a barakah. It shows ijtihad is alive. For if every marja agreed on every other marja, it's a rubber stamp, then where is ijtihad? Ijtihad is dead. Allah says, you will continue to differ. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكْ وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ Except those on whom your Lord has mercy. And for this did he create them. This Quran is saying in Surah Hud uh, 119. And the word of your Lord is fulfilled. Certainly, Allah says, those who reject, I will fill hell with the jinn and men altogether who reject me after having been given so much mercy and rahmah. So I... Conclude tonight in this time that I've been given. Within the next six minutes, I'd like us to focus that the social implications are powerful. 
Very important for us to encourage it. I was reading an article today that the rise in killings in school is becoming astronomical. Every week, children are killed in schools. It's unbelievable when you think about it. School, the most innocent place, a place where children are gaining knowledge. It's not a place that's building bombs or guns or it's a gangster that's robbing, that's indulging in drugs. It's a place of education for God's sakes. In the most advanced nation on earth. Think about this. You think we pat each other on the back. As the most advanced nation in the world, we have the power to put instruments on other planets where we don't have the power to keep families together. Hmm? Have you thought about that? The opioid crisis has reached astronomical numbers. I told you yesterday, just fentanyl, one carload, there's such a market, it can destroy all of America. North America, not America, North America, including Canada. There's a market for it. Now, we can talk about it some other time. Why is all of this coming? I used to speak about this 20 years ago. I said they took God out of the schools. In one way, I don't blame them because those some people who believe in God were extremists. But they didn't know how to balance, so they cut one off. And when you cut one off, there's a chargeback. There's a relationship that's going to come. It's going to haunt us. Today, so many children are getting killed. You know which industry is growing? Security industry. Security. They've got cameras that now can sense even the sound of bullet. So now it's getting very technical. You're going to enter a very highly technical, it's like entering very, very classified area, you know, like in the Pentagon, where all the cameras are on you and everything you move around. Children are getting terrified that I'm coming to school and I've got all these eyes looking at me and I don't know what to do. And I'm entering all these metal detectors and I've got teachers holding guns and I've got soldiers and I've got guards walking around with guns in school. Can you imagine the psyche of education? It's like studying in a prison. It's happening. So there's a billion dollar industry starting now called securities in school. And budgets are in the billions to now to arm schools, public schools, arm them. The NRA is having a field day with that. Researchers have come and said, what is the solution to this sickness? SubhanAllah, and I'm reading this article, the researchers say the solution is to sit with the children and talk to them. The solution is to reason with them. Solution is to encourage them. Solution is to give them tranquility and stability with conversations. Human touch, it's missing. We run a school in Michigan, the academy, Wise Academy. It's interesting. Kids, when they come to us, we have two to three, two to three interviews. We talk to them. We ask them, the school you went to, did they have an interview? They said, no, we're just a number. As soon as we apply, welcome, come in, because the state and the federal government is going to give us money. It's money for us. Bring them in. Fill up the classes. Doesn't matter. You're a number. You're a nice guinea pig. Come on in. Come on in. Give us the money. You find charter schools are like that. Charter schools just want to stuff the kids because the government is going to give them good money, and they're going to get rich. Does anybody talk to this child? Does anybody care about this child's future? You find, ironically, sadly, across the board, and I'm not pointing fingers to all the schools, some are phenomenal, but in general, they have no time. You're just a number like in a prison. Come inside, run it, give them that degree, get them out of here. This is the problem. And I'm generalizing here, I'm making it very simplistic, but it's much more than that. But what I'm trying to say is, the experts have concluded, sit with them, talk to them, Allah says who? Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard wa akhtilafi layli wal nahar la ayatin li uli al albab alladhina yadhkuruna Allah qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard rabbana ma khalaqta hada batilan subhanaka faqina adhab al nahar Here Allah says indeed in the creation of the night and the day alternation, creation of the sky and, and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day are signs for people deeply rooted in knowledge. Who are they? They sit, stand, and lie on the sides thinking. Let's encourage our children to be conversational. Let's encourage our children to ask questions. Let's talk to them. 
And if we come to a dead end where we cannot answer something, then work with them and say, you know, son, you know, daughter, I haven't come to the answer yet, but we will research it together. We will keep asking till we get the solution. That effort is what grows us. That's what takes the sadness away. That's what takes us into happiness. That's what gives us sukoon. That's what creates a broader thinking person. And of course, I encourage all, as much as we can, travel, please. Travel. Go out of your communities. Move out. Go see people of the different worlds. Qul siru fil ard. Fandur. Go see it. It's very important. Children, adults who travel have a much broader vision in life than those who don't travel. In this month of Ramadan, the barakah Allah has given us every single day. I thank Allah that my life, I remember from childhood, because of these institutions of jama'ah, jum'ah, hajj, umrah, ziyara. You see? Ziyara. Imagine how encouraged it is to do ziyara. Ziyara of prophets and ahlul bayt. You know how encouraged it is? It is highly encouraged. Why? Why? Those shuhada visit us in our homes if we're good. But Allah says, go to them. Travel. The Prophet says, travel. It's good because it's healthy. You will see your leader. You will understand. Just going to the harams of our imma is so powerful. I cannot describe it. The incredible aspect of visiting the shrine of an imam of the Prophet, going to the Prophet's grave, going to Jannatul Baqi, touching that ground and saying, here lies that great person who once stood on this earth as the flag of justice and modesty on this earth. You know how important that is? It's different than when you read it online. It's different than when you watch it on YouTube. It's real when you touch that grave. It's real when you meet the people around you. It becomes a surreal experience. I encourage us all, as much as we can, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we get the opportunity to do ziyarat of Qabri Rasulillah, wala imma, well, of the imams also. And may Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah, to become good role models for each other and to indulge in conversations and to reflect deep and to encourage our children to ask and come up with solutions and you will see the Quran is the is the answer what Quran has is deep look at a verse it's confusing reflect on it look at another verse and try to understand this verse Quran bil Quran and then go to the hadith understand the hadith understand the sunnah Practice that. Read the articles of society today. Read political articles. Read political science. Read psychology, sociology. Compare. And you will see the Quran has already mentioned it with perfection. But these scientists out there are just beginning to discover. May Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah, to achieve that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهلا وتظل بها النفاق وأهلا وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة لا تعتك القادة لا سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم وآخر الدعوة الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته